Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, thank you so much for sparing the time to be here with us today uh, for the second webinar of the CTT3 course. Um, today's webinar will mainly focus on the content that you learned during week two, that is on cybersecurity threats. Uh, vulnerabilities and risks. Um, and today we are joined by a guest speaker. But before we invite him, I would like to just give a few housekeeping um, guidelines. So one, we would really appreciate that uh, you share any questions you have with us, uh, whether about the session today or about the content that you've been interacting with whether there are challenges that you're facing, uh, you can share them in the Q&A section of uh, Zoom and we'll be able to either answer on that Q&A section or your question will be answered live. Uh, so please, as we continue with the session, please share your questions there and constantly check it as well to see whether your question has been answered um, through a typed answer. Uh, the other thing would also encourage your participation uh, with uh, the guest speaker today. Uh, so when you're prompted to answer some questions, you can answer through the chat and would really appreciate your uh, participation. Uh, the other thing is that the webinar recording will be shared as well. Um, you will also receive last week's webinar recording uh, by the end of today. So thank you very much for joining us. And now I'll welcome our guest speaker, uh, whose name is Bethwell Chitala. He's a very experienced cybersecurity professional. He currently is a, um, a consultant at Deloitte, Nairobi, and he works in the risk advisory uh, department. Without much further ado, I would like to welcome Mr. Chitala. Thank you so much, Patricia, for that. As I said, my, my name is Bethel Ch Chitala. Yeah, and I'm part of the Deloitte team and I'll be here with you today. So to start, for this cyber threats and mitigation, I'll just start by saying that mainly, yeah, we after the COVID recession, which happened in 2019, most of the educators, they, they, they diverged more into the online teaching. Now with this, it became convenient for people to learn in the comfort of their homes but also it came with a significant risk, which was, are, are, are the students protected? Are the data, is the data which uh, we are sharing, the personal data is it safe? And also the teaching materials, can they be safe? So yeah, some of the e-learning platforms which you've interacted with, you can just charge some of them. You can put some of them in the chat box, we, we see. I'll start, an example will be something like Zoom. Have most of you interacted with Zoom or Kenex? Yeah, I can see someone has said Teams, Google Meet. Yeah, so I see most of you yeah, are familiar with this. WhatsApp. So yeah, for mainly they're just the Signal, WebCT, Telegram, some of all held classes in Telegram, Zoom, as I said, Microsoft Teams, and many, many more. Now with all of this, yeah, we need to input some safe guidelines so that uh, both the teachers and the students feel safe in while conducting the learning sessions. So yeah, moving on. The main elements of this e-learning platform. Now, these e-learning platforms both stem from three main elements. The first one being the sharing of information. This is basically the sharing of the teaching materials such as the notes and yeah, the teach and also student input. And also this also goes to also sharing the meeting invites to the conference links. Now that is the first aspect of the e-learning platform. The second one is the interconnectivity. Basically this means the internet connection and also the connection between the teachers and the students in a shared network so that they can share the information. And then lastly, collaboration. This is basically collaboration between three main pillars, which will be the teachers, the students, 
and also the parents or guardians of the students. So yeah, with these three, basically they form the core part of the e-learning platforms and how we deliver the training content. Now with these e-learning platforms and online learning and all that, uh, there are just various attacks. It has opened the platform to various attacks which cyber criminals have exploited and plan to exploit also in the near future. Now, my job is just to educate you and just guide you to some of the cyber attacks and how you can mitigate these attacks. One of them is phishing. Phishing is basically when an attacker sends an email or a message which tricks you, the educator, or maybe or a, the normal person to reveal personal or confidential information. This will mainly be in the form of something like they'll send you a text or an email which will prompt you to input your credential logins. This is your username and your password. Now, once they have that, they can really cause damage to the system or even access personal information like student contacts and also predators can use that, which will lead to very terrible consequences. Over 90% of cyber attacks today start with this phishing. This is a very important fact. So we need to prepare ourselves against this phishing. Now, another form of attack is the ransomware. Basically what happens in a ransomware is cyber criminals, they'll access your computer or machine, then they will get a hold of your information which you need, like maybe the teaching material or any, any information basically, then they'll lock it and only unlock it once you pay a ransom. Now this would be very expensive because they can ask for ransom, ransom up to 20,000, 40,000, depending on how they would feel. So yeah, we should just aim to prevent ourselves against this ransomware, which I'll be going through in the next session, in the next topic. Another type of attack is Zoom bombing. I don't know if being educators, I know you've, some of you might have accessed this, but basically Zoom bombing is when these online teaching platforms that you mentioned uh, earlier are interrupted by intruders. So basically what they do is people join in, then they disturb the virtual classes. They could expose unwanted or harmful media. And I know all, you all know what I mean by that and how the consequences of that could be dire, especially if maybe the chi children are underage. The next type of attack is data breach. A data breach basically is an incident which basically involves that your private or sensitive information, such as let's say student data or payroll or anything like that is accessed without authorization, maybe stolen or something like that. So yeah. and then the other common type of attack is the Internet of Things vulnerability. Internet of Things is referred basically in short as IoT. Now with the IoT, the devices such as laptops and, and phones, smart home accessories are not, when they are not updated, updated regularly, the attackers can gain access into those uh, devices let's say someone can gain access into your smartphone you know your smartphone is connected to your computer which means they'll also have access to your computer maybe in your computer is where you store the sensitive data and that's how they they get access gain access to that now these are just the most common types of attacks to the educators and teachers out there which are which are facing and I'll just move on to show you just how you can combat some of them and mitigate those attacks. Now, with the e-learning, the main form, I've condensed them into four main uh, ways of how the teachers can pro uh, protect themselves against these attacks on the e-learning platforms. The first one would be sharing information safely. Now, by this, I mean, for the information sharing, information goes a lot of things. We'll start first by the meeting invites to the conference links. You should make sure you send the meeting invites only 
to verified approved student accounts, like maybe student emails which they have shared with the school, that the official ones, and you confirm with the students beforehand. And other than this, this will this will just help to uh, solve something like the zoom bombing. And other than this, also is knowing how to share the training material. Just share them also through the pre-approved emails and also just use the school provided emails if given the next one will be engaging parents from the get-go now for this aspect you will just need to all of you to engage like both the teachers and parents to come together and create a safe a safe environment such that where the students are safe and they are not vulnerable to such internet cyber threats. The next one will be to verify student identities. Basically, this means that before when the students join, the, but this will work mainly for a small classroom first, when the students join, you verify that, yes, this is John or this is Mohammed, this is whoever it is, such that, so that you are sure that the students are the ones joining in. And also, this can also be done by let's say for a bigger platform, there are also things like two-factor authentication. Basically, this means that, yeah, there's a way you just verify, like, if this is you, they sent a code and you can know, like, this is actually my student or something, or, or this is my teacher. So, yeah. And last but not least, you need to teach the students the basics of cyber readiness. Now, the basics of cyber readiness, they are just very wide, but can be condensed to one, good password management. For the good password management, basically this means that you, you should have a strong password. And for this, we would recommend like having a good password manager. There are many password managers like Padlock. You can just search in Google or Play Store or App Store, depending on which phone you're using, then they can just guide you to the, some of the good password managers out there. Now, moving on, as I had said earlier, phishing is the one which affects most people. So I'll try to speak on that. Now for phishing, how you can mitigate this attack? Mainly, first and foremost, you need just to read through the emails carefully which are sent. Make sure that these emails are coming from a valid source and you know this person and yeah, they, uh, and they're like very, they're valid. With this, you can just check the email name and they check the email content. Now for this, make sure you should not open attachments before validating that this is a valid source for the email. The attachments could be maybe a zipped file or a link or something. A link also counts as an attachment. Just please don't click on any links randomly. And also, if you suspect that this is a this is a phishing attempt, what you can do is you can report the incident to your local IT staff uh, so that they can look into it. An example of a phishing text could be, let's say this one. This is your phone. You are like I've seen many people. It's in it's uh, at night. You receive an email from an unknown center saying like, <laughs> for these people who watch football, hi, Mr. Sala, you've been relocated to a new school as part of the teacher's service commission arrangement. Now, when you see this, you are familiar with similar texts, but you've not yet confirmed the sender. They can be using a very convincing name or something like that. This also could be in form of an email. And they send a follow-up like, this will come with a significant pay raise kindly provide us the credentials to finish the process. Now, of course, with this, your interest is very piqued. You also want to see this opportunity and all that. So you quickly jump to send your login credentials so that you can be approved. And that's just how they gain your login credentials. Or they might even, this is just an example. It varies. They might send, someone might send you an email and say, click on this link, like, hi, check on the payrolls I've just received, click on this link to uh, check on your payrolls. Or now being the World Cup 
season this year, they say that you've won a, a ticket to the World Cup finals. Click on this link to access your watch. I know being the festive season, most of you might be tempted to jump on it, but I advise you, please don't. <laughs> now, uh, just a brief activity. Uh, to type in on browser and type in this, have I been pawned? It will bring you to a page like this. It's just a brief activity. You can tell me in the chat when you are and you've searched this when you're on this landing page. Thank you, Shepard. I've seen you say that you really understood fishing. Is everyone on this landing page? Have I been pawned? Just type that in the browser, then it will come. Yeah, I can see some of you access the page, and even the link is provided in the chat. Now you can just try to type in your email. This site just shows you if your email is still valid, it's still good, or it has been compromised. If you see it is green, it is valid. If you see anything else like red and some notifications there, you can see how your data has been has already been sold to different companies. I hope you are happy with the results. I can see Joseph here, his email is green. So kudos to you, Joseph. <laughs> Akimu, yours is red. I'm so sorry. You'll need to update your password to a strong password. Wow, most of you are red. <laughs> Basically, that's that. You can just be checking regularly your emails to see if you are on the green side or the red side. But if you find yourself on the red side, fear not. Just you can. I would advise you to just get a good password manager, then update your password accordingly. And just as good practice, just do it like regularly, at least every three months once every three months. Then moving on, based on the attacks described before, the cyber attacks, it is the responsibility of both teachers and heads of institutions for these education systems to provide guidelines for, to follow, safe guidelines, so that everyone can have a safe space of learning and gain their knowledge. Now we'll start mainly with the summary guidelines for the teachers. This is in a summarized version. Now, the first one will be to update your systems regularly. Basically, this means when you have an update, these are normally called patches on your software. Yeah, you can just, it's good practice to regularly update them. And also have up-to-date apps like this Zoom, WhatsApp, everything, just keep them up to date because with the new updates, they have increased security measures, which makes them less susceptible to attackers. Then the next one, as I had said earlier, is maintain good password management. You can use a password manager like Passlock or Padlock or, yeah, there are various out there, but we will be informed on this in the subsequent uh, sessions. Then another one is for the cyber security guidelines, basically is you should use the proper channels for reporting cyber crimes. Now, for most people, it could be you could report them to ICT department or your local ICT staff for things like the phishing and all that. But other things like when you notice someone who should not be in your class and is, is a suspect them to be a predator, you can follow it up with the local authorities, the local police, or whoever can deal with, or your local security in the institution to deal with that matter. Now, for the heads of institutions, what you can do is, First and foremost, you need to spread awareness and conduct training, regular trainings. Now, this awareness and training should be done regularly so that people are always vigilant and on their toes on good cyber measures, like all this which we've been spoken about. And you can just do some research and also find 
there are some good things out there is they're just one Google click away. Then the other one is to advise the heads of institutions of management to create a plan to handle the cyber attacks. Basically, this will be what to do before a cyber attack, before you are attacked, what should you be doing in preparation? What should you be doing during the cyber attack? Like avoiding panic, who to contact and all that, and also what to do after a cyber attack. Basically, this will be the learning the lessons, gathering the what you've learned and how to avoid a similar instance. Then also another one is developing strong cyber security guidelines. Basically, the all learning institutions you should endeavor to st provide strong cyber security guidelines, which will enable both the students and teachers and even the parents to know what is expected of them and also to to just be always on the safe side, so that to prevent any. Uh, any adverse consequences from happening. But so yeah, basically this is just a condensed version of the guidelines, but you can, I, I advise all of you to d dive deeper into this topic because it is really a sensitive topic and you can just keep yourself up to date with just new and emerging ways of staying safe and all that. But so yeah. That is my time. Thank you for this session. And I very much appreciate your, your like cooperation during this session. And I saw most of you are really chatting. So I'll hand it over to Patricia for the Q&A and the remainder of the session. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Um... Bethel for that amazing uh, presentation. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. And um, I think I'll start with the one for uh, checking the email breach. There's someone who says that they were not able to actually see that and whether you are able to repeat how you check whether your email has been breached. Okay, for that, checking the email breach, there was the link provided in the chat, the have I been pawned. I think if you can just type it, type the link on the chat so that maybe, yeah, the link has been provided. So basically you can just access this link, type in your email, then it will just show you. If you see, basically, if you see it is green, yourself. If you see it is red, yeah, you need to start asking yourself serious questions. And you can do this not just for your email. You can check the students' emails, your fellow teachers and educators and all that, just to make sure, yeah, you are safe. And if, see if, if it is red, you can just, you know, update your password to a stronger password, so that which is less susceptible to hackers. All right, thank you for that. And... Uh... Thank you for also covering what to do when your email is read because there's someone who actually asked that in the chat. Uh, okay. What do you do once you realize that uh, your password or rather your email is read? And so, yeah, you basically uh, follow up and see which breaches you appear in and then you change uh, the password for those accounts that, are, that may have been compromised. So at the end of the day, good password security is really, really important because that is what protects your accounts from uh, being compromised. And while at it, also enable uh, two-factor authentication because this, again, will add extra layers of security to your account. All right, uh, someone asks, uh, suppose you open an email and read it, um, will that cause phishing? Mainly, how phishing works is they can send you a phishing email, you open it. But usually it is followed up with a link or uh, a, an attachment or something like that. But just reading the phishing email would not serve as, you, you might not be hacked, but it's just common practice. Okay, good practice. Basically, when you receive an email, first preview it there's the preview function before opening it because there are some people who, out there who have like 
custom made the uh, the attack such that even when you click on it it will send an alert to them and they can use that to like e execute the attack but basically just it's good practice to preview them verify the sender if you don't recognize it you can just forward it to you can mark it as spam or forward it to the IT department and now as i said also before just make sure you don't open the links any links unless you just know this is a val valid source of information, yeah. From the chat, as I can also see that, is phishing just limited to emails? No, phishing can be done through any form of communication, it can be done through text, it can be done through, but mostly it's through emails. I'm sure for the people in Kenya, they've received the text like, hi, I am your son, and my calculator is broken and I need maybe money. Th th those are just, or send me this so that I can do this for you. Those are just some forms of phishing. And basically phishing is just a subset of social engineering, but we'll come to that later. But basically is just be careful with your data and keep them safe. And also be careful just not protecting your data you're also responsible for your students' data. So yeah, you should keep that in mind. And for the next question, any attacks on WhatsApp or Telegram? On WhatsApp or Telegram? Now, there are many common attacks which have been done before, but to, for the simple attacks which I've seen is someone can just put a profile picture of someone you're familiar with. Let's say I put a profile picture of the principal then I chat you, then I ask you maybe to send something or do something which would otherwise compromise, enable me to gain compromising information. That is just one simple way. But yeah, just on WhatsApp also, just be careful with the links also. The same goes for Telegram. There are different channels out there which are malicious. They can just have ads and you click on the ads and that's how you you allow access to your computers and all that. So yeah, and for the third question, do you have firewalls or other security features that warn users of such links before someone clicks on them? So yeah, basically there are firewalls in uh, there are firewalls out there in the industry and security features, but. For this, I was just keeping this to a simplistic version so that everyone across the board can understand. But yeah, for those heads of institutions, people there managing the security, there are many firewall solutions out there. There are also enterprise solutions such as SIM solutions, Dactress, but we, uh, we, we'll get more into that, but you can just do some research and find them. But I would also recommend just to ensure that for organizations, you just maintain, I invest in those good security solutions, such as the SIM solutions, the firewalls, so that people can, yeah, be secure. All right, thank you for answering, uh, answering that as well as the, some of the questions that are in the chat. Um, so the next question um, is, uh, please, when I receive when I receive SMSs with a link that I don't recognize, can I in order to delete it, or will that cause me to be fished? As long as you don't access the links, it's fine. But just you can just long press the link so that it can select it, then delete it. Not just a single tap. Absolutely, yeah. So the. I think the security risk here is not just receiving the links, it's actually um, clicking on clicking on those links. That is what will cause the problem. So uh, as much as possible, avoid clicking on any links that you don't know the sources or any unsolicited links. And um, in terms of emails, SMSs, when the deal is too, too good, so chances are someone is lying to you. So if you're being told uh, you want this, it's and click here to redeem, and yet you never entered such a um, such a competition, clearly someone is lying to you. So when it comes to phishing, a lot of the security measure really lies with us 
because we are the targets to make sure that we don't fall prey to some of these tricks that attackers will play on us. And so just knowing knowing uh, the signs of these phishing emails, the signs of a phishing text, it can go a long way into preventing us from clicking on such links. So there's a question about, have I been pawned? Um, so they found out that they were pawned in one data breach and found no pace. Um, subscribe to such sensitive, such uh, breaches. What does it mean to have been pawned and been found in one data breach, but then there were no found paste that were found in, in, the, in the tool itself? What they do is they can gain access to your emails and all that. Then after through like brute force attacking your emails, then cracking your passwords. After they've gained access, what they do is they sell this information to bidders. You can find that this could be anywhere from malicious attackers to big corporations to anyone that would find value with your data. So yeah, after they do that, then you'll see that you'll find, you'll start receiving malicious emails or maybe they can even access sensitive data in the emails. So it's just good practice to, if you see it is red, you should do on your, be proactive on your part to update your passwords. All right, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Uh, maybe some of our facilitators may take some questions as well. Um, I would invite uh, Malusi to take this one. So there's a question on how can I use password managers these are um these are these are tools that we've spoken about in the last in the last webinar as well as uh, today's webinar it was also mentioned so maybe you could briefly guide people on how to utilize password managers hi hi patricia thank you Bethel, for the session so uh, this is to preempt what we're going to go through in week 3 okay so let me break this down so a password manager uh will allow you to store all your passwords in one single place. So if you have, let's say 15 accounts, let's say you have 15 accounts and all of them have different passwords, what your password manager will do, it will allow you to store all your passwords in one single location. And the only thing, so that you don't have to keep constantly remembering different passwords, what it does, it, it, it comes as an extension on your browser. What you, you then do is every time you log on to, let's say Facebook, your password manager will autofill the password for you. Um, so in essence, it allows you to store all your passwords in one place. It also generates passwords for you so that you don't have to keep remembering different passwords. And the good thing about password managers is it generates very strong passwords for you. And they are not passwords you can easily remember. So once you generate the password, it stores the password in the password manager. So at the end of, let's say one year, for example, you have um, 50 passwords and you don't remember any. So that limits you from being, you know, from recycling passwords. And then the only thing the password manager does is you, are, you only have to remember one single password that opens your password manager. So depending on the type of password manager you use, uh, some are free, some are paid, and even the free features on some of the password managers are very useful. I've, I've never actually paid for any password manager, but for institutions like schools where you have many different uh, informational assets, like uh, let's say a school portal, and you have very important information stored in that in those assets, I would encourage you to invest in, a, in an enterprise level password, password manager, sorry. But for personal use, I'd encourage you to use um, like, like an individual password manager. So password managers, uh, will also, I think the good thing that is also very, that happened with the one I use, I use LastPass. So it will tell you that you have several accounts that you are using the same password. So it will tell you you're using password ABCD for account EFGH, which is always wrong. Because as we've seen today, once you appear in a data breach, for example, you are recycling your passwords and password ABCD was used in an account that was in a breach one could easily use that password for another account that was never in a breach. And if you are recycling passwords, then that's how 
an attacker is able to gain access to information that they were not meant to gain access to. But all of this information about password managers, how to manage your passwords, how to be secure, um, is going to be dealt with entirely and very thoroughly in the next week. So thank you for preempting that sort of information. If you have any more questions, I think we'll cover them deeply next week. If I were to recommend a password manager, we have several that we've recommended on the, on the course material. So we'll give you several and then you can do your own research and you can find the one that works for you. Thank you very much, Malusi, for that uh, very comprehensive answer. I think um, also all the questions about password managers really point us to the fact that you're very excited to utilize and implement some of these things that we are talking about in the course. And that for us is very encouraging. And we'll do our very best to guide you on how to actually implement these things and how to use them and, you know, in practice, um, as you've seen, we are trying as much as possible to have practical activities so that you get to do it on your own and to apply the knowledge that you're learning here. So thank you very much for that interest as well. Uh, the next question is, uh, can phishing occur through regular telecommunication channels such as text or SMS? I believe um, Mr. Chitala actually mentioned this, that uh, phishing does not only just occur with emails, it can also happen through text or even instant messaging applications. Anywhere that um, you're able to receive messages or <clears throat> you, can, you can be able to actually receive messages from different people, it means that they are able to send you these crafted messages that pique your interest and with links inside as well that would make you want to click on them. And um, I think I would want to emphasize the fact that phishing emails are usually very well crafted. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself actually uh, giving out information. <clears throat> and so it's absolutely important to be very careful. You would rather be too careful than give the benefit of a doubt and then you end up actually giving away your passwords let's say to um, the passwords for your social media and all of a sudden uh, someone else is taking over your account so you'd rather be safe than sorry then uh, the other question uh, i believe some of them have been answered already in terms of the password managers uh, the next question is, uh, does it mean that if I have a password manager and someone accesses my device, will it not autofill the passwords when he or she visits a site where I have an account? Malusi, would you want to take this? I think also in next week, it's all very preemptive. And thank you so much. But also in next week, we're going to talk about device security. So in case someone accesses or let's say steals your phone or steals your laptop, there has to be measures before they actually end up on your browser. So if you frequently lock your machine, if you have, um, if you frequently lock your machine, if you lock your phone, then it's difficult for them to crack, you know, in order to get into, into the browser itself. And just beyond using passwords as the end all be all of your security towards um, your websites, there's also the need for two-factor authentication. So the way two-factor authentication is beyond just having your password, you might also be required to enter some other number in order to verify that it is who you say you are and you are who you're meant to, meant to be accessing. So some of you might have already implemented it on Google. So sometimes when you gain access into your Gmail, uh, they ask you to put in your phone number or they ask you to input a value they're going to send to your phone through SMS. So you, you need two things. You need your password to access Gmail, and you also need your phone to access the secret code they're going to give you in order to actually truly access your email. So there's, there's that, that level of there's device security, and then there's two-factor authentication. If I'm missing something, maybe some of my panelists could help me. But I think... Uh, there has been the question of autofill being a security gap, but if you buffer if you buffer it up with other security measures, it's a lot difficult for someone to actually just gain access into uh, your passwords. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'd say. Or Linda or Bethwell have anything to add? 
had, had uh, invited to do so. I believe you answered the question really well. And um, again, this will be covered in week three. So um, look forward to that. You'll understand more about passwords as well as device security. Uh, there's a question in the chat on uh, what are some of the dangers of never signing out of my email box? And uh, there's also another question on how can I protect my FB account from being attacked? Uh, so on the first one, what are the dangers of never signing out of my email box? I don't think there is a danger, especially when, you, when you've when you not signed out in a trusted device. So for example, the laptop that you use on a daily basis that is yours, that you have well secured uh, through some of the measures that Malusi has talked about, about device security, then that device is already protected. And so it means that for for your email to be accessed someone would have to have physical access of your of your device if you're already signed in so i don't think there's a danger in that however there is a danger if you're using a shared device so for example at cyber cafes or a device that a lot of people use for example let's say it's in a school and um, teachers may share devices such as uh, desktops uh, but in that particular desktop you've also um, you've not signed out of your emails it means that every other person that has access to that device then would have access to your email and that can lead to data loss and um, other people might be able to actually read your emails and that is not very safe. So in trusted devices, I don't see danger in it. Um, yeah. And then the next question on how to protect um, an FB account from being attacked. Uh, number one, and this applies to all social media accounts, and this is mainly on account security, is one, we've talked about strong passwords. Uh, we've talked about two-factor authentication to make sure that um, to make sure that whenever you're logging in in a new device, then you need something else to verify that it is actually you. So should your password be compromised, then they would also need to compromise your other fa um, second factor. For example, if you're being sent a message via device, uh, they would also need to compromise that for you for them to be able to take over uh, your account. So those are two, um, and I would also add, again, avoid clicking on on links because a lot of times those are the those links will lead you to pages where you may disclose your credentials, you may disclose your passwords without actually knowing it. Sometimes attackers will create like a clone of let's say Facebook or Instagram, and then they will tell you please change your password. Once you input your correct password, then it will just redirect you to the to the uh, normal Instagram application or Facebook application. And so you will actually not know that your, your password was compromised. And so it's very important to avoid clicking on links, avoid sharing your password as well. Um, again, sign. Uh, do not just leave your account signed in in devices you do not trust. So if you've ever used a cyber cafe um, to log into your social media, make sure that when you leave, you've uh, logged out uh, from all those, um, in all those accounts that you had logged in. So those are the top I could think of right now. And um, there's also another question on what type, what kind of apps can we use to test the password we want to use before we apply it? And that's a really good question. Um, one, in password managers, a lot of them are able to generate by default very strong passwords and so if you use the auto generator for different password managers they will be able to give you by default very strong passwords however if you're not using a password manager there are sites actually where you can input a password you want to use and it tells you how long that is going to take to crack uh, how strong that particular password is i'll share one in the chat that i have used before or have used to demo just password uh, strength uh, to different participants. And so you're able to use it to just input a password in there and you'll see how quick it is to crack. And if it's easy to crack, it means it's very simple. It's something that can be easily guessed. If it takes longer to crack, it means that is a strong password. 
so there's a question on uh, what's the best way to treat phishing emails? Is it delete or simply disregard? Uh, Mr. Chitala, would you like to take that? With phishing emails, first I'd like to answer that twofold. In terms of the education institution, it's just advised for the institution to have like security solutions in place so that they can just capture this phishing emails before even they reach your your account out your outbox account or gmail account but also the best way to deal with the phishing emails basically is just now there are just protocols there are some institutions with cyber protocols like you can re, you can report them as phishing emails or send them forward them to your it ICT staff, or if those are not options for you, you can just, if you see this, that's a phishing email, just delete it. So yeah, uh, unless there's anything to add from your side, Patricia. I believe you've answered it correctly. Um, so it will depend. Um, yes, Malusi, would you like to add? Depending on the, the email you receive, uh, I think it's important for you to your IT department, and then they're able to see where it has come from. If they're able to see where it has come from, then they're able to block the source. So it's easier for them to respond to the phishing email because if you delete your IT department, will never know that type A people were trying to fish your school. So it's always important to send that email, forward the email without clicking, without downloading the attachments or opening that att attachments. Send it directly to your IT department if you have one. And if you don't have one, please forward it to um, your site or whoever is, is responsible for responding to incidents of cybercrime nature. So that's something I'd like to add. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, there's also a question on what are the different signs to recognize or to check if an email is a phishing email? And uh, I think this is a topic that a lot of people are very interested in, in terms of phishing or social engineering. And I think I can cover just a bit of um, the signs of a phishing email. Number one, I think one of the biggest one that is used is a sense of urgency. Uh, and a sense of urgency is mainly to make you panic a bit so that you, you, you act in haste and then you disregard security measures. So for example, if you receive an email that tells you that your account has been suspended, if you do not change your password within the next 24 hours, your account will be permanently deleted. Like that is very strong language that would make you panic a little bit. And uh, you may be very tempted to actually click on that link simply because of that sense of urgency or something that tells you that uh, we identified suspicious activity somewhere, um, please click here to review something, anything that makes you feel threatened in a way uh, or pressured to do something, you may want to actually think twice about it before you actually um, do anything about it. And then you also have, you may have grammatical errors, especially in the email, in the email and even in the body. So for example, a lot of... Um, phishing emails will use uh, very famous or reputable organizations. So for example, here in Kenya, we have um, organizations such as Safaricom, which is a telecommunications organization. And so since it's very widely used, you will find that um, attackers will emulate uh, an email that is coming from Safaricom. And so you will have maybe uh, Safaricom, and then instead of the I, you will have a one. So those are like d changes that would happen to make you think it's coming from Safaricom, yet it's just someone who has tweaked their email to look like it's coming from Safaricom. And then um, in the body, you may find um, you may find grammatical errors as well, or you could find that uh, this email has a lot of shortened a lot of shortened uh, links that don't tell you primarily where this link will lead you. And so clicking on such a link, which has been shortened, 
can actually lead you to another site. Because when you shorten a link, then you're able to input whatever it is you want to put there. For example, you can shorten it and say this one leads to Safaricom homepage. While ideally, when you click on it, it leads you to a much um, to a malicious site, I would say. So it's very important to have to be aware of such um, such signs of phishing. And I'll post a link in the chat of some some phishing quizzes that you can take actually um, to just to familiarize yourself with phishing emails and how they can look. And through this quiz, you, you're actually able to learn way more about, you know, about phishing, about how ideally phishing emails will look like, and it can make you vigilant against um, these attacks. So I'm sharing one right now. You can actually also search yourself, just phishing quizzes you can take online and you'll be able to find a couple that you can use to practice uh, just to make sure that you're not... Uh, you don't fall prey. There is another question on um, there's someone who received an e a message actually that says, um, hello, Madam Grace, I've sent 6.8 million via Western Union for clearance of container JX4 and JX7. And there's a password there as well. Um, I received this message in my text. Is there's a phishing email? Yes, it is. Just because it does not contain a link doesn't mean that it's not trying to lure you into, into doing something else. And so any email that kind of wants to solicit something from you, a text message, a phone call. So for text messages, this will be called a smishing. So literally S SMS phishing. So we contract and we, it, it becomes smishing. If... If someone is trying to call you or just lie to you on calls, we'll call that, that voice phishing, which is an initial vishing. And so there are different ways in which uh, this can be done. And a lot of the times the signs are almost similar in that it's just trying to make you trust this person, make this person seem like a trusted source, and then you're able to divulge information to these people. Maybe we can answer one last question and then um, we can close the session. So we have a question on where exactly do fishers get our emails? I would like for our guest speaker to take this one and then we can close the session. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Uh, first of all, I'll just like to say, I know as teachers, you know, when you see many questions, you know, people are really enjoying the session or keeping track of the session but so yeah for the question how where do the fishers if you can call them that get your details so basically what they can do is yeah like your contact information like when you say if it is in social media sites or things like that they can basically access them from there or maybe some of them have access to directories which contain the folders which contain some contact information basically so like let's say your organization say they, they can gain access to the school they gain a list of in, emails which people in the school use then they decide to target specific people like who they see they might not be very tech savvy then they exploit that. But so, yeah, basically that's just one of the ways they can gain your, your contact, if I may say so. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for um, that answer. And uh, there were questions about how to access the Telegram group. I have posted the link on the chat. So if um if you had not joined the group yet uh please click on that link and you will be able to join us uh we have been having really great discussions in there and we really appreciate all the participants that take their time to also answer questions that are raised by other participants we really love to see that uh to see your interactions and to see you help one another 
Uh, so with that, we'll come to the end of this webinar. However, we would I would like to assure you that if you asked your question and it was not answered live, uh, when we are sharing the webinar recording, you'll also have access to the Q&A document and you'll be able to receive some of the links that we've actually talked about in this webinar on that document and you'll be able to follow through with it. Uh, so <clears throat> if there's anything you did not catch, um, the webinar recording will also be shared with you and you can go through it. Um, it is It will be downloadab downloadable, excuse me, and um, you'll be able to access that as well as our present, our guest speaker's presentation. So all these are things that will be shared with you. So thank you very much. And thank you to Mr. Chitala for taking the time to grace our webinar and to talk to our participants about uh, cyber threats and mitigation. We have had a really lovely week uh, seeing all your responses on the forums. So please, continue with uh, the active participation and we really look forward to having you in the next webinar. Uh, do have a lovely rest of your day. Uh, thank you very much.